Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer, nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. Someone else here would like to say a few words, and it's our wonderful, distinguished, and beloved Dr. Terry Shintani. As she said, I'm Dr. Shintani. I've been a longtime member of the Vegetarian Society, but this is very special uh, uh, this evening because we have uh, as our guest speaker uh, Dr. John Kelly, who is the founding president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and for years I've been on the advisory board to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, so I just wanted to give him a proper Hawaiian welcome with a lay. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Terry Shintani. It is now time again <laughs> to introduce our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight, John Kelly, MD. Dr. John Kelly completed his undergraduate studies in biochemistry and molecular biology at Shepherd College in West Virginia, graduating summa cum laude as a McMurrin Scholar. Wow. He then completed the dual MD, MPH degrees program at Loma Linda University with honors. He is trained in preventive medicine and has done private and government funded research in lifestyle medicine. Dr. Kelly, as uh, Dr. Shintani pointed out, was the founding president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and serves as adjunct faculty at two medical schools. He he currently practices lifestyle medicine at the Black Hills Health and Education Center in Hermosa, South Dakota. His presentation tonight is entitled, Are Genetically Modified Plant Foods Better Than Eating Animals? Why Are We Vegetarian? Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Kelly. Uh, first, I just wanted to show a few slides and tell you about um, the work I'm doing. Uh, I appreciated Dr. Shintani and uh, Lorraine's kind introduction. And it's true, I have been uh, very active in lifestyle medicine, um, really, for quite a long while. Uh, the other part of, that's so amazing to me about um, the p story that was told is that um, Medicine is a second career for me, actually. So when I went back to Shepherd College, um, I was 46 and uh, to go and take my pre-med studies. And so I had to, I tell folks, well, I've been working fast because I only have a short amount of time to do what I need to do. Just kidding. So uh, the Black Hills. I want to tell you just a little bit about that real quick. Um, now this is a picture I took myself. It was quite remarkable. You, San Bernardino was on fire. This was a few years ago when I was at Loma Linda. Um, after I finished my residency, I was on the faculty for a while. And I can't remember the year, but I believe this was somewhere around 2002 or three. But it, was, it looked like everything was burning within sight of the university. And, and walking on the campus, we would have little puffs of, of the ashes Every, walking around, just everywhere you step, there would be puffs of ashes. Okay, well, there's another fire that's even more dangerous and more problematic, and that's the fire of America's health. You know, America's health is probably our biggest problem. Maybe the world's biggest problem is global warming, I don't know, but, but um, in America, I would dare say that our health is even more of an immediate crisis than um, other things. This little chart here kind of illustrates the point. This is taken from um, the Employee Benefit Research Institute, Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services, 2005 to 2015 data are projected on here. What this is, is these bars represent the uh, 
thousands of billions, so this goes up to four and a half trillion, the thousands of billions of dollars spent of national health expenditures. The blue line is the percent of GDP. So over here you can see we started off uh, in the 60s about 5% of our gross domestic product was spent on health expenditures. But now we're headed up here, uh, of course we're beyond 2015, we're headed to 20 some percent. The question that this chart begs any thinking person, I think, is how much can we afford to spend on health care? I mean, we, we are already, uh, the most expensive thing in an American-made car is not the steel or the satellite system, it's actually the health care for workers. So America's health is on fire. And lifestyle medicine is the one thing that can put the fire out. By the way, our wealth is also on fire because that's what's consuming our, our economic advantage in the world. Here's a little graphic taken from Scientific American of 2007, and it's showing the spread of obesity and overweight in the world. And the, the top highest color is 60%. So this was a few years ago. We're, this, this problem is getting worse fast. So Black Hills, we're located within sight of the um, Mount Rushmore from on a good day uh, when the, and the sun is in the right position, I can, we can see these faces in the distance. This is um, the campus from uh, a nearby point we call Inspiration Point. You can hike up there in about 15 minutes and get quite a view. Over here we have the farm in the greenhouse area. This is the main lodge. Have some beautiful weather up there. In fact, we've been enjoying an Indian summer. Um, they tell me that we came to Hawaii at the wrong time. We were having good weather. You're supposed to come to Hawaii when you're having bad weather. I think we're gonna get, we're gonna get back in time, just in time for the big snow. Anyway, so it's a beautiful place. We offer two options, 11 day and 18 day programs. This is similar to a McDougal program, except it's in a retreat center instead of a, uh, the hotel. We use the Complete Health Improvement uh, Program as one of our curriculum. So, tonight's topic is eating genetically modified plants better than eating animals and why are we vegetarians? And um, I have to confess that I did not know that this was a hot topic in certain parts of Hawaii when I suggested the topic. Uh, it's just a topic I have a, a serious interest in and I don't hear a lot of well, I hear a lot of talk about genetically modified organisms, but it seems to oftentimes be more heat than light. And so I really wanted to talk about it from a scientific and philosophical standpoint rather than a political one. You know, it may seem unlikely, an unlikely idea, but 99%, I believe 99% of the vegetarians around the globe have a singular characteristic in common. No matter who you are, if you're vegetarian, I would argue that we have, I've got to change my notes here a little larger, that we have a singular characteristic, and that is we have chosen to be herbivores. Now, there, I'm sure there are some herbivores that have not chosen that, and would maybe some would like to change their choice. I don't know, I haven't met any yet that are, um, wanting to change the, the choice. But even though we share this one characteristic, there are many reasons or rationales for why we have made the choice, okay? And I think that some of those reasons include the following. Many want to protect animals from the cruelty that is inflicted upon feed animals or animals grown for human consumption. Uh, some of us want to protect what we view as the right to life of fellow creatures who cohabit the globe as their rightful abode. And still others seek to be good stewards of our shared abode uh, and protect its increasingly fragile environment. Many seek to be good stewards of their own bodies, have better health, have better well-being. And I've met some that actually just don't care for the taste or the palatability of 
animal foods and they prefer to, to eat plants. And I've met some who wish to live a more self-reliant, simple life, and they've said, I find uh, plant husbandry simpler and easier than animal husbandry. And then, of course, no doubt, there are others. I wonder if there's some in the audience that perhaps I've, I've missed your reason or rationale, and I don't mean to exclude anyone. But I think, as I've looked at this, I think perhaps the most common reasons for choosing a plant-based diet really has to do with protecting something. We're wanting to protect either our fellow creatures or our health or the planet. And what's kind of interesting and wonderful is that actually we accomplish all of them at one time. And I believe we, that, that a choosing to be an herbivore is multifaceted in, the, in its effects. And I think of that as being a good steward. So I'm going, I'm, I realize I'm presenting a, um, I'm leading you down a path, hopefully that, that it doesn't, is to trap you, but to lead you down a path of logical process here to a reasonable conclusion. So if you differ with some of the points I'm making, that's all right, but I want to, I'm going a little slow to try to make my point so you have time to think about it. As my wife says, this is not, uh, this is stuff you have to chew on. But anyway, I know what made me choose to be a vegetarian, or choose a vegetarian life is what I call it, and then a vegan one over 40 years ago, was a desire actually to honor the creation. I hadn't uh, thought about some of the things I learned about later as I met more and more vegetarians. I've learned lots of good reasons, but my particular reason that appealed to me at that time was to honor the creation. And you know, this motive is shared by really millions of religious vegetarians around the globe, from Hindus to others. Uh, and it's interesting to me that many, if not most of the reasons for being an herbivore are actually encompassed in that motive of honoring the creation. And I actually feel a very kindred spirit with fellow vegetarians, whatever their, their rationale or reason is. We have something very strong in common, and I appreciate that. By the way, I wasn't the least bit surprised to learn that it's good for everyone and everything, including those who are not vegetarian. Do you realize that, that by the science is showing that by choosing a vegetarian life or lifestyle and diet, you're actually helping even the people who haven't yet chosen it, is the way I refer to them. They haven't yet chosen. I'm just half teasing there. I have good friends who, who are paleos, and they are not, they're definitely not vegetarian. But when we, now, next, my next point here, and then we'll, I'm gonna make some dot points and we'll connect the dots. When we think carefully about choosing what we eat and what we don't eat, we realize that such a choice has to be based upon what we consider to be true what we consider to be truth, if you will, and uh, about this world. I remember um, when I was a young fellow, I, I think I was a teenager, maybe early teens, somewhere around 12 to 14. I remember thinking about stuff that you really can't spend too long thinking about, it'll drive you crazy probably. But anyway, I actually wondered, I can remember wondering if my mom had not married my dad, and married somebody else, would her have son been me or would it have been somebody else, you know? Well, I didn't know anything about genetics and of course it would have been somebody else. But, you know, it was some of those things you can... So I've pondered some things, uh, including why am I a vegetarian and what does advancing science have to do with my choice? Or advancing understanding, uh, not just knowledge, but understanding of knowledge. And so, you know, this is simply the nature of human knowledge. We're limited. Uh, during our what I call our cognitive lifespan, okay, and if some of you have dealt with people who become demented, you know what I'm talking about. The cognitive lifespan usually is shorter than the total lifespan. But during your cognitive lifespan, you learn things, you understand things. And as you do, as I do, I want to be what I call responsive to the evidence. 
okay? Like, don't confuse me with the facts, please. So I, I want to be responsive to what I learned. And it has certainly adjusted. Like I said, I started off as a vegetarian, and it wasn't too terribly long until I became a vegan. And I would say that was, well, some people might argue with me. I have had good friends who argue uh, with me and say, well, that was not progress. But I think it was progress, and it certainly was based on my advancing understanding of things. Well, anyway, this evening, I want to bring some information and facts to your awareness and offer a few rational conclusions that I think honest, conscientious individuals might logically draw from them. Now, I want to say that I, I have to confess I did not come across this information by design. I did not set out to, to learn what I'm uh, telling you tonight because I was vegetarian or because I thought it had anything to do with being vegetarian. It's just that as a result of my studies in medicine, as I shared earlier, second career for me, my previous career was actually IT, but um, I learned things that were extremely relevant to my uh, vegetarian lifestyle, and I wanted to share some of those with you. You know, when a trained physician, do we have any physicians here besides myself and Dr. Shintani? Anyway, another physician, okay. But when a, when a trained physician, and there are others who have the same experience, but when you encounter the near death of a human being that you cannot explain, that you do not know why it happened, it creates a conundrum that as a physician you feel you have to explore and understand because you want to avoid future deaths. If something is a near-death experience, for all you know, the next person, it might actually kill. So, so I'm speaking about the uncontested fact that a dentist and some others almost died from allergic reactions after eating processed corn. This happened, I believe, in around 2000, 2001 or so. It's been a few years ago. Now, the supplier of the corn that the, was traced to asserted that the death, well, it wasn't a death, a near death, the, the possible death, was the result of erroneously mixing corn intended for animal consumption with corn intended for human consumption. And if any of you are familiar with this story, these stories, there were more than one of them. There was a lady also um, that um, had a similar episode. The thing that was interesting about the dentist was that he was so interested in trying to find the cause, he volunteered to eat the product again and see if it was indeed that was causing the problem. It, it was indeed, and they, they pulled him back. Uh, he was, he was uh, medical care was present when he ate the offending corn. Well, anyway, the thing about this is, is that while the supplier asserts that the problem was a mix-up in the food channel between animals and humans, um, I grew up in the hills of Virginia, and I can remember many times eating corn that was grown for the animals, and I found it quite satisfactory for cornmeal. It wasn't so good for sweet corn. Uh, you know, the field corn is not nearly as sweet. But it's been known for generations that humans can eat animal corn. So this was not just a mixing of the wrong kind of corn with the wrong, you know, for humans. Uh, something else happened, and the, and the missing link here, uh, the rest of the story is that the corn that was prepared for the animals, intended for animals, was genetically modified corn. Uh, it's called Starlink, if any of you are familiar with the, the particulars. But now keep your hat on, because this unfortunate incident does not prove that no human being can or should eat genetically modified corn. Not logically. You cannot logically draw that conclusion from that one thing I've just told you. But however, don't go back to sleep either, because it does prove that genetically modified corn can be dangerous to some people. Just that one incident proves that. And like I said, I told you the rest of the story, the dentist actually did some more experimenting so that we, they could find that out. Now, it's the job of qualified epidemiologists and uh, 
nutritional scientists to work out the cause and effect relationship or what's going on here. Unfortunately, that was impossible and was not accomplished because society rightly frowns on doing studies that could kill human beings. It's hard to recruit subjects. And suppliers of genetically modified corn are very protective of their patented formulas and they're actually not very uh, forthcoming in providing material for that kind of testing. So really, we are left with an incomplete understanding of just what happened and why. Now, during my undergraduate work in biochemistry and molecular biology, I performed personally, along with other students, a number of laboratory experiments. And among those were experiments where we added genetic material to a living organism to give it some special phenotypic characteristic. Uh, one of the ones I thought was kind of frivolous, but it was fun, as we inserted some firefly genes into some E. coli bacteria, and uh, they glowed in the dark. That was just really cool. Uh, but the other thing we did was, let me explain how it works just a bit. Um, many of the bacteria did not survive the process, but plenty of them did. Uh, what, and what we did was we, uh, so we put some plasmids, which is a little circular piece of DNA, that had the genes we wanted in the bacteria. We put those in the medium with the bacteria. We put a certain amount of electrical charge on the solution, and uh, that destabilized the membranes of the E. coli enough that the plasmids could slip into the, uh, into the bacteria. And then uh, an amazing thing about cells is that they are highly organized structures and so when the bacterial cell identifies some new DNA floating around, it puts it in where the DNA is supposed to be and so it sticks it into the, into the chromosome and it becomes an active gene. And what we did was we added an um, antibiotic resistance gene so all we had to do was take the bacteria after we had sort of shocked them to take up this plasmid, we plated them on a petri dish that included an antibiotic in the medium. And so the only bacteria that would grow were the ones that had resistance to that, to that uh, antibiotic. And they were also the ones that would glow in the dark because we had both, ge both genes on there. So that just a little, I won't be going into that much detail all night long if it bored anyone. But that's just so you get a sense of how it works and that I do, I have, I'm not, a, I'm not a PhD, but I have done it and it isn't that complicated. In fact, I think we could do it in your garage if you want to sometime. It's, it's pretty easy to do genetic uh, modification nowadays. So, uh, now the science and the technology has gotten better since I was, you know, uh, an undergraduate. Of course, that was a second career, so it wasn't that many years ago, about 20 years ago. Uh, but you know, a lot of the crops that we're producing and eating today that have been genetically modified were actually developed in the 90s when I was taking my training. Uh, for example, we've had BT corn and Roundup Ready soybeans for decades. And the technology I worked with was quite crude, but it, it, it was the technology that many of these crops, you know, were developed with. Many of the gene insertions that we performed were not viable. Remember I told you that we would shock the bacteria to make them take up the plasmid. Well, some of them, they've done research since then, and we've learned a lot more. We thought initially that the shocking process was what was killing the, the E. coli bacteria that didn't survive. We found out that that is one of the causes, but there's another reason that they do not survive, and that is, in some cases, taking up the plasmid is fatal. The actual insertion of the uh, plasmid DNA into the chromosome of the bacteria is done in such a location that it destroys the viability of the bacteria. 
And so what this helps illustrate is that gene insertion is still, even though it's advanced 15 to 20 years since I was doing some of it in the lab, it's still a very crude kind of shotgun approach. We simply do not have enough knowledge to know how to put a gene exactly where we want it. What we do is we take a group of cells just like you people here, and then I, sh I shoot some popcorn at the audience, and, and some of you grab it and, and enjoy it, and some of you get hurt, hit you in the eye or whatever. So the point is it's a shotgun kind of th approach. And that's why there's a second part of it is you find, you go about finding which of the living cells that took up the, the inserted gene are functioning, which ones you, you want to use. And this is important. I know it's a little, uh, taking a minute to get, or, or two, a few minutes to get to the point. We're almost there. Well now, one other thing. I can still remember, and I've got my textbooks. I haven't thrown away, you know, those textbooks were so expensive, I can't bring myself to throw them away. They're 20 years old and probably never look at them again, but I've still got them in case. I, but I can still go to that textbook and show you this term called junk DNA. We were taught that in biochemistry in those days that most of the genome or the DNA in any cell is actually junk DNA. And here's why. Because in humans, the, if you take the entire amount of DNA in your chromosomes, less than 2%, somewhere around 1.3%, 1.4% is actually genes. It's actually only that small amount of it is used to, to produce proteins as far as the genetic sequence. And so they thought, well, the rest of it, 98% of it is, is junk. In fact, it was thought that this was left over from the evolutionary process, you know, uh, sort of vestigial stuff. And of course, it was possible um, under the evolutionary concept that some of it was new genes in the making. You know, that it was accumulating, because you know, ge genes involve hundreds to thousands of, of uh, DNA bases and so, if you you know, they don't, evolution, they wouldn't assemble in one moment, right? It would take generations and generations to build up this possible gene. Well, anyway, either way you look at it, at, the, at the, any given moment, only about 2% or less of the DNA is coding for genes. Now, what this means is, we've now learned, um, of course, one of my favorite topics to talk about is epigenetics, okay? I'm not talking about that tonight but that's probably what I talk about more than anything else, is because we've learned what that other junk DNA is actually doing, part of what it's doing. Turns out that a great deal of the DNA in a cell that does not code for a gene is coding for a switch on a gene. It actually affects which genes are turned on and expressed and which ones are not. For example, you know, just a real quick brief uh, biology lesson. You know that we came, each of us in this room, we came from an ovum from mom and a sperm from dad. Those two separate cells had to join and, and actually become a single cell. And then from that single cell, it made two cells. Each one of those made two cells and so forth. And so t nine months later, or if you were on time, uh, nine months later you were born with trillions of cells. Every cell came from the first one, right? We all know that, but you haven't thought about it. Because what that means is that you have all the genes for a liver in your ear. Aren't you glad they're turned off? <laughs> you know, you've got all the genes for a left ear in your right ear. In fact, what we've learned is that the majority of the genes at any given time are turned off. And so it turns out that the switches on the genes are probably more important in a way than the genes. And so maybe that's why we have 98% of the DNA is for switches and only 2% for genes. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so that's, I can't, you know, I can't give a talk without talking about epigenetics, so I had to throw that in. But, but the gene switches are, are very important. Okay, now. In the insertions that we were doing in the E. coli bacteria, what we've discovered is that some of them, the insertions were going in a, in a good place, 
and some of them were going in a bad place. And what I mean by bad is they were not having the effect we wanted. Perhaps it might have caused the bacteria to glow in the dark, but it may have ruined its ability to digest lactose, and so it would starve to death. But until it died, it would glow. Uh, and so, hopefully, I mean, there's, most of this tonight is humor, hopefully humorous information. So you, you can laugh if you need to. But anyway, uh, but anyhow, we no longer speak of junk DNA, okay? This is, a, this is a, an invalid old term. There is no DNA in your chromosomes that is junk. And it, as far as we know, uh, probably most of it is doing something, good or bad, but it's doing something. So, um, I'm going to skip a few of these facts here. Here's what we know. We know, and I want to say we, I mean credible uh, collection of scientists. I'm talking about some weird, you know, rogue scientist, not some rogue doctor like me, but some real mainstream accepted expert. Uh, and most of the time I fit in that category. Uh, I just don't tell them, you know, the rest of the stuff I think. But anyway, so, but we know that, that our modifications have altered things about the, the function of the genome in living organisms that are unknowable. Let me say it again. We know enough now about genetics and epigenetics and genetic modification that the way we're doing genetic modification is producing consequences that are unknowable. Okay, now that may seem radical, but if you stop and think about it, uh, there's a lot of things that you do in life that uh, the total consequences are unknowable, and you'll go ahead and do them. This is like you, I flew over here, I just got, we just landed not too long ago, I got on that airplane, and the outcome of that trip was unknowable. I wasn't really sure if I was gonna get here, I, for all I know, we would be like, uh, what was that, Flight 370, you know, and you'd find us somewhere in the South Pacific Indian Ocean or something. But anyway, uh, so there's a lot of things in life that are unknowable. But I was happy to get on that plane because in the U.S. we have laws that require a person who's going to fly the plane to have taken certain training to pass certain tests, to not be intoxicated. In fact, they even make them sleep on long flights. You know, some of us doctors in residency, we, wa we wondered why, why we were getting accepted, why couldn't we sleep? But anyway, so, so I was willing to do it because there's controls in place, and it, to me it was a reasonable risk. By the way, one other thing I want to say to you, do you know that vegetarians, we are, what's the word I want to say? We are selectively more impacted by genetic modification of plants than everybody else on the planet. Why would that be? Well, we eat more of them. We have a higher exposure. It would be the way we might term it. So I know that I have a higher exposure to whatever the risk of genetically modified plants are than my friends who are, say are on a paleo diet or an omnivore, I mean a carnivore. So what also makes this a little more complicated is that our U.S. government has been uh, convinced or whatever, they, they, they act as though the genetic modification of organisms, especially plants, is just an extension of the selective breeding and hybridization process uh, that's been we've done for years and years and years. In fact, if you've heard, of, if you are any know anything about this, you've heard about the fact that uh, wheat. Well, let's see. We could say wheat, chickens, uh, cows. Those three organisms um, have some of the most long-term selective breeding on, on the planet because we've been keeping cows a long time and farmers have always smart, you know, they don't, if you grow anything, do you take the weakest, puniest looking one and plant those seed? No, you plant, you plant the ones that are the best looking, nicest plant seed. 
Well, if you've got cows, which ones do you breed for the next you know, generation of cows? You take the ones that are the most of what you want. They produce the most milk if they're milkers or they have the nicest taste, whatever. So my point is that these things, have, we've been selective breeding for a long, long time. And dogs are another thing that are, uh, we've been doing that with. And so sometimes what we find is people have allergies to a food and I'll have them try a grain that's a wild grain that hasn't been so selectively bred for a long time and, and lo and behold they can eat a more wild type grain. Some of you are familiar with that fact. But here's the difference. So selective breeding is simply causing species, or I'm sorry, pairs to mate that you, by your design. So if I want the, this certain bull to mate with a certain cow, you know, I put them in the proximity of each other at the right time and they'll do that. And they'll make babies that are from that. And I don't let that bull, uh, you know, fertilize or mate with a cow that I don't want that combination. That's selective breeding. Okay, hybridization is a little bit different than that. Hybridization is a process where we take and we fertilize a, we pick the parents and we produce an, off, an offspring that that offspring has the characteristic we want, but hybridization does not breed true. Then the second generation will not have that same. It always has to have the same combination of parents and it's the first generation that produces what you're after. And that's why if you've ever had hybrid tomatoes or hybrid whatever, you can plant it and it will grow, but it often does not have the characteristics that made you want it in the first place. You have to go back and get the original two parents and have that. Anyway, it's called an F1 hybrid. Um, okay, so now, I've shared a bunch of stuff. Uh, now let me just apply this to, oh, one more thing I want to tell you. One more fact. I go to a number of conferences uh, it's an honor to be here speaking to you. Uh, there are people in this world that know a whole lot more about this than I do, but uh, they don't always put it together exactly the same way I do. But anyway, uh, I'm willing to, uh, I think it's good to mix science and philosophy as long as you don't try to tell everybody else what to think. But it's good to get them to thinking about what they think. Well anyway, this, this speaker, the last speaker, at the International Congress on Vegetarian Nutrition at Loma Linda University about five years ago or so, I forget the date, he made a statement that I have never forgotten, and I don't believe I ever will forget. And it altered my life. It's actually affected my career and my thinking. Now this was a food scientist working in the field of crop production. I believe he was from Australia. And he told the audience that the nutrient content of food was changing faster than nutritional epidemiology was capable of discovering the health effects of that food. What he told us was, because the whole conference was about the benefits or the risk of vegetarian nutrition, and here's a guy gets up, <laughs> he says, I grow food, and let me just tell you, we're changing the food faster than you're figuring out the effect on health. So I thought, uh, I spent a good bit of time thinking about that. After all, I told you as a teenager, I was wondering about what would happen if my parents would have married somebody else. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting around thinking, well now, at that time, my career was nutritional epidemiology. I was studying the effect of nutrition on health. And I'm thinking, why am I doing this? It's, uh, by the time I figure out whether this kind of soybean is better for you than this kind of soybean, the soybeans won't, will be different. It won't be anything like that. Uh, Anyway, I, I finally decided to quit thinking about that because it wasn't good for my job, and I decided to go ahead and keep on working on that as long as there was money, uh, funding. I'm half kidding. But anyway, in plain English, as we might say in the hills of Virginia, the target is moving faster than the bullet. So, you know, the BT gene uh, was, came from the bacillus thuringi thuringiensis, thuringiensis. Anyway, it's a bacteria that produces this poison. And uh, this endotoxin. And what has been found and uh, proven now, we know this is a fact, 
See, there's another thing I didn't tell you. There's so much to, to know, but it turns out that bacteria are very promiscuous, okay? And this isn't a moral thing, like, okay, human promiscuity is usually has a moral dimension, but for bacteria, there's no moral to it. They just share their DNA. And it's a lot more active sharing than we ever imagined, actually, uh, two or three decades ago. So it turns out that the re one of the reasons that uh, antibiotic resistance is spreading as quickly as it is in the microorganisms is because they are pretty active at sharing their little secrets with each other. And so, um, so no one was really surprised in the, that are at least microbiologists or geneticists um, that the BT gene put into food, like corn, um, is getting taken up by the bacteria in your gut. And, and it's active. So, I mean, this is wonderful when you think about it, I guess. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding right now. But anyway, this is wonderful because pretty soon we won't have to put the BT in the food anymore because we'll have bacteria that can make all the BT we want. Uh, so, anyway, that, that was a total joke. But anyway, so, it, but this is a fact. It is a fact that, that the, the, the microorganisms in my gut and in your gut, if you have been eating BT uh, in your food stuff, they're gonna have it. And it's gonna be active in many of them. That's been already shown. And let's connect one other dot. Again, a lot of this stuff is circumstantial. We cannot prove that the BT gene in a, in a, a certain gene in a certain ear of corn is causing me to have leaky gut symptoms. But the doctors are saying that we're seeing more and more leaky gut kind of things in their patients. We know that the way the BT toxin kills the corn borer and the other bugs is it makes their membranes super permeable. And so there's no reason to be surprised if it tends to make my <laughs> gut super permeable as well. Uh, but there's a lot of science yet to be done to prove that, okay? It's right now it's just a plausible explanation and a coincidence. But it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. How many of you, when you throw a ball, any of you ever thrown a ball or a rock, you know, just pick something up and throw it? Okay, how many of you, when you did that, you picked it up and you thought, okay, now, I, I need to throw this about 75 feet. I'm probably gonna need to throw it about 30 feet high, probably about an angle, about, you know, 35 degrees. You just picked it up and threw it, and it hits the thing, okay? So there's a lot of things that we are very good at. The brain is very good at these uh, global search kind of conclusions, and yet when we try to break it down, we can't figure out why we, I don't know exactly why I threw it that way, I just know it, I, you know, I hit the target. So I'm just trying to say to you that there is a lot of science that needs to still be done to prove yes or no to some of these things, but you don't have to be a scientist, I don't think, to realize that there's some implications here. Here's a question I want to ask you as an herbivore, if you're an herbivore. Not everybody, you don't have to be an herbivore to be here. But how much animal in my food is okay? Did you ever ask yourself that? Okay, so how much animal in my diet am I okay with? And of course some folks I know are very purists and they say none. In fact, they would say you shouldn't be wearing that belt because there's leather in that belt. And I don't know, I think I might have leather in my shoes. And I don't mean this to be insulting, it's just that there's different reasons that we do what we do. And I'm really okay with people who don't even eat honey because, you know, the bees make it. But I, I'm not there myself. But I do have this question, how much animal my food is okay? Do we only have a problem consuming whole animals? So follow me with this just a little bit, okay? Do you, do you only have a problem eating the whole animal or would you be okay to just eat part of it? Okay, how about animal products? Okay, so we don't really wanna be able to tell it's an animal, just, you know, just do whatever you do and then I'll eat the, whatever, the hamburger. Or how about animal extracts? Or how about just animal proteins? Would you be okay with just animal proteins? Um, and how do we know where to draw the line between plant foods and animal foods? Did you know that, you know, Linnaeus, who put together the, the uh, phyla, and he divided it into plants and animals, and then there's bacteria, and then there's, well, we don't know exactly where the mushrooms fit, they're in there somewhere, and then there's, prote you know, 
well, there's these things called protozoans, and they're kind of, well, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated. And then when you actually start looking at the DNA, well, lo and behold, there's proof that there's plant DNA in animals, and there's animal DNA in plants, and it's, it's kind of complicated. In fact, it's really complicated if you try to, to uh, figure this out. So it turns out the world is a lot more complicated than we wish it was. And of course, that's what makes it exciting. And that's why I'm married to my wife, because she's not at all like me, and we have a lot of fun. But anyway, so now let's get practical. <laughs> so many rational people, herbivore and carnivore, understand that in order to make a choice about what you eat, you have to be able to do what? You have to be able to identify it. Now I know that seems like uh, this guy is crazy, you know, I learned that in kindergarten. But think about it just a minute. Do you realize that you actually cannot identify what's genetically modified, at least not easily? And of course I already told you about the case where they mixed it up and, and there was genetically modified corn in the human food chain that wasn't supposed to be there. I didn't tell you the rest, of another piece of that story. Uh, that's Starlink. You can look it up. Check this. Check my facts. But Starlink corn is been a, is now known to be its effects are in the human food chain, and and the experts tell us, and it's true. I mean, I'm not the I'm not a geneticist, but I've trained in it. But we will never get the genes out of the Starlink corn out of our food chain. They they you just if you don't understand that, that's just the way it works. Once you put something in the gene pool, you do not go in and take it back out. It's like if you put a drop of water in, in the bucket of water, then you say, oh wait, I want that back. So you, can you go get the drop of water? No, you can get a drop of water, but you cannot get the drop of water that you put in there. And so when you put this into the, to the gene pool on the planet, or maybe the cosmos, uh, it's there. And the thing is, so let me look at these reasons that I gave earlier about why people, why we are, are, are herbivores, and let's just look at it. So I said, one of my reasons was, many want to protect animals from the cruelty inflicted upon feed animals for human consumption. Now, feed animals are being genetically modified, right? You are aware of that. It's not just plants. Our topic tonight is about plants, but, but the animals are being modified, and I would want to point out to you that they're also being fed genetically modified plant foods. These are facts, indisputable facts. Everything we've learned about the effects of genetic modification applies to the animals. They are subject to disease. By the way, you might be aware that often they're actually engineered to get diseases so that we can study human diseases in animals. Something called the agouti mouse, for example, very uh, expensive, a lot of work done to put diseases for human obesity, diabetes, heart disease in the mice so that we can study these diseases in mice. And I'm, I'm personally uh, think that's better than, than uh, I think it'll save more lives than it would have to not do it. But my point is, and I respect those who disagree with me, but the point is we have animals that are being injured uh, by genetic modification. And, and I think that we need to have an intelligent conclusion about that, if you know what I'm saying. We vote by, uh, in, with our dollars in our society. What you spend your money for has more impact on what the supply will be a few years from now than anything else you can do, I believe. And you need to have intelligently thought about this to know how you want to vote with your dollars. So could the motive of protecting animals somehow apply? So if, suppose I'm an herbivore because I want to protect animals. Would that same logic lead me to want to uh, think about genetic modification of the plant foods that are being fed to the animals? Uh, why would it be that feeding genetic modified plants to animals wouldn't harm them in ways similar to how those same plants would harm me if I eat them? And, and by the way, did you know that it's documented in multiple 
publications, papers, scientific papers and others, that animals in the wild often actually uh, don't choose to eat genetically modified food stuffs. So uh, at least in many cases, uh, animals will not of themselves choose it. Okay, another reason I gave was that some people want to protect what they uh, view as the right to life of fellow creatures on the planet. And so my question for, if that's your motive, is does their right to life include the right to natural reproduction or simply the right to a life dictated by homo sapiens? What are the rights of non-human creatures on this globe? You know, that was a question the first time someone brought that to me. I thought, this is like totally out of left field. What are you talking about? But as I thought about it more, um, I'm, not, I'm not at the most extreme, I don't think. I know people who are definitely m more black and white about it than I am. But I, I do believe that, that, yeah, the other creatures on this uh, globe have some rights, right to life. By the way, uh, is not eating animals being an herbivore sufficient to protect their rights if we eat genetically modified plants instead? You should think about this if you haven't. How does eating genetically modified plants impact the right to life of non-human species that we seek to protect by not eating them? If you haven't thought about it, I encourage you to do it. Would we be doing more to protect them if we did not eat genetically modified plants as well, is the question. Okay, now I said still others seek to be good stewards of our shared abode on this globe and protect the environment. How does introducing new to nature products impact the environment? Is it possible or even probable that we do not know the impact of genetic modification on the environment? It's, not, it, it's a fact. I mean, that is actually a fact, I can tell you. We do not know all the ways it's doing it. Have we already encountered any surprises? Did you know that there have been a number of genetic modification things done um, that have produced unexpected results? The experts, the geneticists who were doing it said, we did not expect this. We did not understand how, why this happened. When you have a lot of surprises in something you're doing, what does that tell you? It tells you your understanding of what you're doing is still faulty. Doesn't mean you shouldn't keep experimenting, but, but when, I, when I can't reliably suture a, a, a patient and stop the bleeding, and I'm some, you know, every now and then I'm like, wow, I'm sure glad that stopped. I'm not sure what I did to stop it. Well, I, th I need to study some more. <laughs> Maybe I should stop operating for a while too. But anyway, so my, and I'm not a surgeon, so you're safe. But my point is that when you have unexpected results and you're an expert, that tells you your knowledge is incomplete. And my dear friends and fellow creatures on this earth, this knowledge about genetic modification is still quite, uh, Incomplete. Okay, and then I said, uh, oh, by the way, how many generations does it take to, for the impact of germline inheritance changes to be manifest? Think about that question. How many generations does it take for the impact of germline inheritance changes to be manifested? Will we live long enough to know, or are we leaving that question in its solution for our children and their children. We know for sure that genetic modification is changing the environment in irreversible ways. Okay, another one was many seek to be good stewards of their bodies, enjoy maximum health and well-being. That's where I started. That was my primary motive in the beginning. What are the health effects of genetic modified plants? Do we even know the answer to that question yet? And if we did know, how could individual consumers act upon that knowledge? Follow me, this is an important one. This is where I do get kind of heated. Uh, I'll try to be calm and talk only about the facts, but it bothers me that lobbyists have attempted to subvert my ability to know what's genetically modified and what's not. I just, somehow I just don't trust that kind of behavior. Uh, you know, I believe in transparency, Knowledge, informed consent, freedom to vote, um, all that's part of my 
upbringing. So I think that this whole thing necessitates that genetically modified products have a reliable label, that you should be able to be an informed consumer. I mean, why is it more important to know that an apple was grown in Chile than to know that it's been genetically modified? I don't understand that. But as you may know, we have laws that require you to say this apple came from Chile. But you don't have to say that it was genetically modified in America. Oh, uh, it's a little strange. Okay, and I said some simply do not care for the taste or palatability of animal foods and prefer to eat plants, while some wish to live a more self-reliant, simple lifestyle, and so on. Um, how does genetically mod genetic modification affect your simple ability to grow your own food? This is, a, uh, this is a little bit sobering to think about this, but they have something called the terminator genes, right? You're familiar with this? This is basically uh, a technique that allows the seed producers to make sure that you cannot uh, grow the plant from the seed of the, of the plant. So it's, now, I don't mind that. I mean, I, if you want to play the game that way, that's your business, but what I don't like is that they these terminated genes are going to be just as promiscuously shared as, as other genes. I mean, this, this is, I think, all bordering somewhere close to insanity. But anyway, it's not a good plan, in my opinion. And did you know that some have been sued for growing crops containing patented genetic material that they did not put there and did not know was going to happen? I mean, folks, come on, let's, put a, let's think about all the things that we do know. Anyway, so back to the first question of the night. Is eating genetically modified plants better than eating animals? Why are we being vegetarian and vegan? Well, I believe that each one of us, obviously, is this is a question we have to answer for ourselves. I cannot answer for you. I will say to you that where I stand, I'm not planning to start eating animals. I don't think that's the solution. But I am going to, to continue being a selective about the plants I eat and think about not only trying to protect the animal by not eating the animal, but maybe I'd also be trying to protect the environment and the diet that the animals are having to live on as well. So anyway, that's uh, my bottom line is that uh, think about why you're vegetarian, apply that to this area of knowledge, and act accordingly and responsibly. Thank you for your time and attention. So thank you all again for coming. Have a safe return home tonight. Mahalo. Good night, everyone.